Thank you so much, everybody, for, for, for coming for our math part two. I know some of you weren't there, uh, weren't there for, for part, uh, for part one, but don't worry about it. It's already registered. And if you ever need to kind of have a one on one on that, that's not a problem. I'll catch you up. Um, let me share my screen for part two. So today we're going to talk about, um, <clears throat> actually collective marking. Uh, we're going to specifically talk about um, the student side of it. So when we're looking at examination and breakdown of rubric, here we I, I selectively picked the mid of the crowd because, you know, the, you have the CCB and you have the DBE. So I said, you know what, sec three seems to be like a middle because I just need an example to go through. So if we take a look at the rubrics of sec three, it looks something like this. I'm sure you're familiar. And by the way, these are public documents. So you can give this to your students. They're in the program, okay? They're in the program and they're, they're available for you to use, you know, with your students. Because all the, remember, based on the first workshop, if you take a look at, at each rubric, let me just get it closer. Notice that you have, the competency and the title, the quantity, so the student is aware. Well, what's the percentage? And we all know in math, there's no two parts. So there's only one part, which is a cumulative exam. So there's no practical and theoretical. It's just there's an explicit and there is a competency component. So the explicit, like you all know, it's a 20%. And you have the competency uh, evaluation, which is 70%. Um, well. So 80%, sorry, there's a 10 missing, okay? So notice over here, they, they separated the percentages in uh, uh, by uh, the evaluation criteria. So you have um, criteria 1.1 that is worth 10, uh, 10 points out of the uh, the 80%. And then you have the 80%, that's it. And the 1.2, it's 20, uh, 20 marks out of the 80. So criteria number one is worth 30 out of the 80. And notice over here, when we're looking at competency two, so again, the same thing, you have the rating scale. And this is just to give you a heads up also, these scales going to change. The terminology is gonna stay, change, but the idea is the same, it's just the terminology is gonna change. And you have here the evaluation criteria, you have 2.2, 2.2, uh, usually it's 2.1, 2.2, but logically it should be evaluated 2.2 before 2.1. And then you have, of course, the 2.3, okay? Uh, that being said, notice that the breakdown over here, the 2.2, when you're talking about the implementation of the mathematical reasoning, so we're talking about 20% and the correct appropriate mathematical concept process, you have 15. And you're talking about, this is a very important thing to show to your student. If you have students that are always asking, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? I have the right answer. Well, technically it's only 5% that is worth. So this is something really nice to show your students from day one, that the process is worth a lot more than the right answer at the end of the day. The right, if you have no steps and you just have the right answer, you can fill this up and just give them 5% in the front of them, say, look at the rubric. This is how I'm gonna correct you throughout. And it's, you just got 5% with the right answer. If you don't give me traces of how you got there. And notice that the other 75% is on how you get the answer. So we have to switch our way of thinking. So that being said, and of course, notice that the competency three we're not evaluating competency three on its own. It's already embedded in competency one and competency two. So just to me to be clear, and notice over here, proper organization and uh, of steps in an appropriate procedure. Notice over here you have uh, a ten percent. So organization of the uh, of your reasoning is just. Uh, well, it's not just. It's actually really important, but it's it's evaluated at. Um, at uh, ten percent, so notice I have my fifty, which is the second uh, competent, well, second competency. And uh, if you notice over here, I have my thirty percent for the first competency. So that's why when we're talking about 
competency evaluation, we're looking at an 80% uh, accumulative mark. The, the idea behind it, just to be careful, not uh, just to get our students with a pretest, that's the first time they see a learning situation, you know, and these rubrics, or the first time they see their rubrics is on the exam. So you have to be careful. These are rubrics that should be given to the students from day one, but not only given, you have to show them how you evaluate. As you notice, these rubrics, they don't have a language that even if I bring teachers together and have a conversation about just how you correct, I promise you based from based on past experience, uh, people pick on words and they have different definition of the same word. So vocabulary becomes really crucial and, and understanding of these rubrics. So when we're talking about an assessment, the rubric is a set of criteria. So it's a set of rules that uh, for evaluating performance and to evaluate a course, so to see if the student was able to achieve what they're supposed to achieve. Uh, notice in a rubric, it's a tool that we all as math teacher communicate to the student uh, our expectation for learning and provide a framework so we talk about fairness, right? So rubrics are used both for formative, okay? That means during the learning and also for summative, which is final evaluation. So that's why it's really, really important that the students are aware of what they're being evaluated on, right? Uh, but the difference between rubric that are formative and rubrics that are summative, the summative is an exam, they do it and they're gone. The feedback on the final exam, especially in adult ed, is very little. You can show the exam, you can give them, like, you know, you can guide them through their mistakes. That's too late when we're talking about the summative component. But during the learning part, when we're talking about the formative one, for every situation, every little project or every conversation you have, it could be oral, could be kinesthetic, could be production, you could go back to those rubrics and say, look, I asked you for this. Show me where you showed me this. Show me how I could grade you on this. Show me. So the students have to also be aware of how, what you want, what is expected of them, okay? So now, using rubric with students, obviously now when we're talking about professionals, when we look at our rubrics, we're able due to you know our background because we've been in school for a long time. And even with that, sometimes you read a rubric and you say, what the heck is this, you know? But for a student, it's even worse. <laughs> so when students get familiar with rubric early on, they seem to actually align what how they what's expected of them with what is um, what you're teaching them, what you're showing them, what you're evaluating in the month. So that those engagement, uh, th those engagement contribute to higher order thinking. So again, like I showed you with the rubric, if a student show you, but I have the right answer, and you show them it's five percent, well, the process of getting to the answer, it's not crunching into a calculator. It requires a bit of thinking, a bit of of, of how can I show the teacher? So you're required a different uh, a different setup from the students to to um, to demonstrate. So um, going over rubrics with the student, showing them like, okay, what do I want from you by the end of this? What do I need for you to show me that you're able to do that? Um, okay, so making sure that they understand the components and they have almost like think about it as almost like a checklist of things they're supposed to be able to do by the end of every module, right? So, and um, these, these student target rubrics make it an inclusive teaching. So we're both on the same page. So when I tell my student, I want you to know the additions because I'm gonna teach you order of operation, that's part of my list. So when I, when I go, well, were you able to show me you could, you could, you could add? And if the students say, well, yeah, look, I did this and this and this. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next, right? Let's move on to the next. So, so we're both on the same page. So it's an easier way to talk to a student when we're both on the same page. Because the secret uh, teaching stuff doesn't work usually. If I say, okay, I'm going to teach you order of operation, but you don't know what you're going to use it for or what's coming next. 
it makes the student feel like I'm just like, okay, I just need to finish this paper and move on to the next paper. And to the, so there's no point to this by, by getting them to see like there's an overview, you're running this because you need to do this, you need to do this. And especially in our classroom, we'll have multi-level of math, multi-modules. So if you have your one to five sec, from sec one to sec five in the same classroom, and the SEC one is complaining, then they could see the SEC four that they're using what they're learning in SEC one in a, in a more complicated fashion. So they see, oh, there is a point. I'm doing this because look, later on, I have to reuse it somewhere. At least making it transparent that way might actually motivate them. Uh, but contextual teaching is even more important and that's another conversation. So again, going back to formative tool, when we're talking about the rubric, the rubric promote, Communication, consistency, transparency, identification of strength and improvement. So again, when we have communication, we're talking about the same common free, uh, common framework. Everybody gets the same, uh, the same kind of rubrics. Very clear expectations. When we're looking con con consistency, there's standards across. So when we're talking, when we're teaching a sec one, it's the same competency to get reinvested in two, three, and four, and five. Transparency, there's no secret learning here. There's no secret agenda. This is what you need to know. An improvement, okay, you didn't get it here, but look, you showed me the previous assignment when we looked at the rubric, you missed it over here, but look over here, you passed it, you did good. So, you know, so it's a way of also having like, um, uh, traces of their learning, right? And at the end, because they've seen what they're expected to do, you could imagine correcting these final exam when everybody's aware of what they're going to be corrected on. It's going to reduce a lot of time for you, <laughs> you know? And uh, the component of fairness and uh, the components of just among uh, students. You know, what's what's so nice, ideally, it could be, we could be in a school that we have maybe 10 teachers. But if I'm a student and I take an exam, any of these 10 teacher could correct my exam and I'll have the same grade between all of these teachers. But if I know it's not a standardized process, not a understood process, like in terms of rubrics, you could understand that, oh, I'm going to go see Mr. Mon uh, Dr. Monjour to correct my exam. I'm going to go to his class because he's an easy corrector because Richard is a very hard corrector. So it becomes unfair. But to minimize that fairness, we all have a good understanding of how what's expected, how we correct. The rubric is understood. So how we deliver the content could be everyone's flair and everyone's style. And we all agree that teachers could be different and should be different. But when it comes to evaluation, we just want to be as fair as possible to all our students, right? So that being said, now we get to, okay, how do we introduce these rubric to our students? Obviously, if you're gonna, if I show, you show them the rubric that are in the program and you say, there, take a look at this, this is how I'm gonna evaluate you. I personally, I remember the first time I saw these rubric, I was like so intimidated myself as I went the heck, what am I supposed to do with this? Never mind. I'm going to go back to correcting the way I know. And I, I was so creative on finding ways to match these rubric because I didn't understand how really it was. It worked. But the more I worked with them, the more I realized it actually comes down to this. Bloom taxonomy is the foundation of, of, of how we should be teaching, right? Obviously, all part of Bloom taxonomy is important. I personally value all part in time and place. We obviously aim the last three component, like analyze, evaluate, create, because these are what we call the higher thinking, right? But you need also the base to be able to go high, right? So in time and place, and there's no order where you start. Depends, the, the student dictates where you should start. And what I want to bring your attention to this is if you take a look closely to the rubric and to the questions on exam, math exams, they all come down to this. If we want to reduce challenges on training the students to be competent in recognizing what is requested, there is specific verbs we need to use to actually guide the students to deliver a specific response. So if I want somebody to create, I'm not going to say classify, 
right? I'm going to construct, uh, create, you're going to use specific words. So if you take a look at your exams and you actually dissect the terminology that they're using, these are verbs with intention. They're carefully picked because they want a specific uh, a specific response to it and a specific uh, competency that they're testing. So that being said, if you are practic practicing these verbs with your students in class while they're learning, the transfer in an exam, you're reducing a challenge. You're reducing a challenge. So cre most of the problem, and, and this was interesting because I assisted to many, many uh, on the French side and on the English side, many centers, and I had conversation with teachers, uh, with their students. What was the like? What was the students like when we did pilot exam or pilot project? What was the problem that the students will always get stuck on mainly? And the majority of their response was they didn't understand the question. Uh, the, the 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 literacy part is too long. The the it wasn't clear. There was a lot of like messing around in the context. And most of the time, it doesn't have to do anything with the math itself. Mostly it's contextual. They couldn't relate to, they couldn't understand, they didn't know what the word meant. And sometimes they get stuck on words and they like they just lost because the word meant something else to them. So just to go back a step, when we're talking about complex situation, we're not necessarily talking about complex context. We're talking about complex uh, thinking, like in terms of like, it's not a one step resolution of a problem. We're looking at multiple step of resolution of a problem. So that means this is the, where the complexity comes from. And this is where the critical thinking comes from. Meaning like I have a situation that I have to do a couple of steps to get to where I need to get. That's where the complexity part contextually shouldn't be difficult. We should minimize those texts. Nobody said that they have to be long or they have to be hard you know, that's why in the learning process, per se, you have the upper hand to build, you know, to build these, these training on like teaching the students to go into more the higher thinking and reduce that anxiety on literacy. Um, contextually to our student, you have the right to kind of not simplify, but create adjust, if you want, I'm gonna say, adjust the context to the reality of the student, but not take away from the complexity of the problem. And you could do that to all level, except SEC 4, the ministerial exams. So any exam that you would read yourself and say, okay, uh, maybe I shouldn't, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, you could kind of rework the context but not take away from the complexity of the solution of the problem. And I'm just, this is just a, this is like what we say, this is just a comment on using the right verb to trigger the right like mindset. So you, the students could be trained, uh, trained in, in, uh, in responding to it. So just to remind you over here, notice this is in the program. You have competency one, two, and three. Competence three is not evaluated on its own. It's embedded in the other two. And like we said, now, one thing in the pro a program that I find super interesting, you have every competency that's defined by feature and manifestation. So when you say, okay, well, what are they supposed to be able to do? These are the manifestation part. Like this is how, we prove like this, these are the proof that we're looking for to be able to accomplish, like to show, to show that the student's able to accomplish this competency. So for example, if we take a look at competency one, using uh, uses of strategies to solve situational problem, like for example, define a problem. Well, is the student, is the student capable to reformulate the situation in his, their world, uh, their words? Uh, are they able to identify the task to be? Do they know what's the question? Are they able? Do they show it to you? How do they show it to you? Could be that's another thing. Like, how do they show you that they're able to identify the question? Is highlighting enough? Is doodling enough? Is is writing in Scrabble a way like form like a way for them to show you that there's many ways of showing you? You know your student. That's the part that you know your student, and you're able to identify if they really understood the problem, they're able to define the problem or not. There is many, many ways of doing that. 
so and and so on and so forth competency two the same thing and competency competency three so these manifestation becomes really really important to guide you as a teacher on how i could demonstrate like to kind of inspire more than uh, to inspire like how i'm able to kind of define the problem the students uh, i'm going to train the students with these strategies to show me that they're able to define the problem so now when you're looking uh, when you're creating a learner target rubric this is the uh, fun part you take your rubric you identify of course you identify which which well this is here what i did is you identify uh the book in this case i took as an example the 3051 which is the algebraic and the graphical modeling and in this case over here i'm looking at the first part which is the competency one and competency three so if i take a look at the first evaluation criteria I have a uh, notice over here, indication oral or written that the situational problem has been understood. Notice the word oral or written. If I use this rubric during the learning, during the formative part, I can use actually conversation. I could listen, mathematical conversation, discussion about the subject. And I'm able to hear by just listening to people, to, to people, even asking questions to see if the student really understands or not. Now, where it becomes really tricky, notice over here when we're talking about the rating scale, advanced, thorough, acceptable, partial, minimal. So what does acceptable look like? What does thorough look like? What does minimal look like? You know? Obviously, for any teacher, they might just look, okay, mid, mid answer, complete answer, screwed up answer, right? And in between, whatever. But what does this mean, really? Identify some of the relevant information and require element. When I look at some, how is this defined some among the math teachers in my center? Is it two? <laughs> two very like two ways two variable we have to have a common understanding about what the words mean and that's where it becomes tricky among teachers why you corrected it this way and i corrected it that way and but my sum and your sum do they mean the same thing so this is where it becomes a really interesting conversation to have among local math teams teammates right so you all have the same, you have to define that. So um, that being said, again, here we get the criteria, uh, the evaluation criteria, and here we have the description. Uh, and notice here, the descriptor assess the degree of achievement of each competency. So with your learners, you could go over the descriptors, and that means you could even take their work and show them example, physical example of what you consider acceptable, advanced, thorough, partial, minimal. But before you do that, you have to yourself know what your expectation when I say, oh, it's an acceptable work. Well, what does that mean? All right, and it's not the answer key. The answer key most of the time gives you, it's just, a, um, how can I say the, it gives you a suggestion. There's one answer there, but there's many way of demonstrating the same kind of um, many good answers, but they show you just one. Now. This is another thing here. Uh, this is one one format that was uh, given to uh, to students, you know, and this activity was done with them where they have all the criteria in here. The, like terminology is it necessary. Always ask yourself, what is it bringing anything to the students more uh, or not? So in this case here, Notice that this is the titles of the uh, of the uh, the criteria of evaluation. Now, how do we demonstrate that? Uh, again, for students, you may decide to use I can statements. I can reformulate. And notice these are, notice over here, these are manifestations that are in the program. So you don't even have to create this. You could take them as is and put them in here and create like almost this format or reformat this. I'm gonna show you many, many ways of working with this, okay? Uh, notice over here, you can say to the student, it comes almost like a checklist. I can formulate the situation, yeah, no. I need help, 
You know, you can reformat this in whatever way you think will be useful to your student. But whatever you give your student, please be careful with one thing. If I give you a tool and I don't show you how to use it, and if I don't consistently use it, don't give it to them. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. And there's no point. So if you decide to use rubrics, you have to have some consistency. You have to use them all the time. And it has to be well understood. Otherwise, it's just another paper and another folder that's going to fall in the recycling bin soon. So please, before you implement any tool for, for the worth of the tool, take the time to learn it. Take the time to play with it and be forward coming. Like, listen, this is a tool I'm trying with you guys. Let's see if it works or it doesn't and give me your opinion on it. And you can build it together. Again, the same ideas goes here for the second part, you know, for, for the second competency. And notice now, once you start building this, you're going to end up having a full, a full rubric that talks the student's language. Could be in a I can statement or could be also in regular terms, right? Proceed to trial and error. Could be a direction, could be whatever. So here I have two, two kind of tools for you to play around with. Um, that you could test with your students. One of them is just simply a generic table of learner target rubric. So here, what you need to do and how you'll demonstrate it. So use words that the student understands, not fancy words. Even us sometimes as teachers, we want regular words. We don't want fancy. We read so much. We've been to school, we've done our work, but we want something we understand and we can talk about. So simplifying things, it's not I think, you know what it is? I think Einstein was the great one I, uh, in saying this. It's not how complex it is. It's how easy you could actually explain something that makes you a genius, right? I don't I have it all backward, but it was this what I took from it, but anyways. So this is another model. Just to show you, this is another model. Problem solving must have guiding question. You could also give them questions. If you don't like questions, you could say, okay, let's do a work together and say, okay, what and they did a wonderful, wonderful job. Now go back and go back through the process with them. Okay, when you did this, what did you ask yourself? Write your own question. So you can also stimulate the student to write their own question and write their own example so they could remember, right? Uh, that's another format. Now, another one uh, also uh, for your high performer ones, they just need guiding question, but they need ask for help. So this is a communication tools. If you have a lot of students in your class, they can use this and then they come to you and say, well, I'm having a lot of trouble with modeling, for example. Can you show me how? So it's a targeted learning. Notice it's the same, it's the same tool that was done differently for the need of a student. So this is where inclusiveness comes. It doesn't change, the criteria is no change is how the student wants the information, how they want to receive the information, so it will be best for them to use it. We don't give tools just to add tools. We give tools to actually use the tools. So just keep that in mind. Get to know your students first. Introduce a tool and say nothing is set in stone. We're flexible. We'll write it. We'll rebuild it. we redraw it. Maybe the colors are ugly. Find a different colors. I don't care. You can put flowers on it but as long as they see the purpose of this tool. So in this case here, some, some, some teachers, they have students who have, they, they want to have less pollution, visual pollution, they call it, and they did just simply the guiding questions and teacher feedback. So this is, again, when they're evaluating work. And there we go. I did it pretty fast today. <laughs> <laughs> pretty fast. I wanted to share mainly that to you, with you as a tool and to see uh, what you guys think. Uh, hold on, let me stop the sharing. Uh, and ask you, what you think? Is this something you see? Do you have any question? Is it something useful? You find it useful, not useful? So thank you so much for doing that, Michelin. That was really, really interesting. Uh, I really, I can identify with some of the ways that I get students to learn material. I could see some of the strategies I use within the content that you just uh, demonstrated. My question is, do you think some of that could be included on their memory aid and, and or is it, does it make too much pollution on the memory aid? Like, you know, I could see some of the key points being taken out and put it on the memory aid so that they remember to do it all the time. So that's 
listen, uh, Shirley, you bring a super, super point. And I think for inclusivity purpose, if you start off in sec one with a memory aid that tackled this kind of structure, you're not, uh, if you go back to this, the kind of question, the guiding questions, you're just reminding them of the steps. You're mm. not giving them the answer. No. And if you see it enough in the learning, it will be memorized. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Mm -hmm. This is the great part of repetition. Mm -hmm. You have to just go over the hump of short term versus long term. Mm -hmm. And if it's long, it's repetitive enough and consistent enough, you hammering the brain enough that will be mm -hmm. imprinted. Because even us as adults, listen, we've been through science, math, uh, French, English, whatever. If you teach only 30, 51 for 10 years, you've done your sec five, you've done your sec one, but go back and teach it. And you're like, oh my God, where did it go? It's mm -hmm. in there somewhere. But retrieving it, it's like almost you have to relearn everything. Yeah. So conservation of energy. If the information is consistent and transferable, I think it's worth the hammering, honestly. Okay. And if this, if you start off on a sec one memory aid with these ideas, and if that's what's going to help them to, 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 like, you know how we do transfer. Sometimes you just have to do the transfer with the student so many times for them to realize, oh, I could do this over here, you know? I could do this, but you have to kind of drill them with that. So there's a purpose for drill too. Mm -hmm. uh, depend on the student, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I, and, and also another thing, just to add to that point, the CCBE is your best bet to, stuff, to start stuff like that. You have a mm -hmm. lot more freedom mm -hmm. to, to, to kind of, mold the student to to fill them up with strategies to fill them up with tricks to fill them up with whatever the ccbe you start from sec one alpha student whatever you start them with the right thing they need to learn yeah. and then trust me if they keep on repeating it listen sec one is a couple of modules sec three couple sec twos you know by the time it's like the seventh module you're in sec three so yeah. these tricks i mean come on <laughs> unless you really really a student who really need more help then that's fine too but there's their memory aid follow them up to a certain level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and if that's every year you revent that memory aid you know <laughs> and you see you test it in class if i if i test it in class uh for the memory aid and i find that they're able to do a situation with less information then i'll save that in that space for something else but visual pollution is extremely important and it's something i didn't know about that I learned about, uh, it's not filling up a paper and microscopically looking at it, is using it during the learning that makes it useful in the exams. It's mm -hmm. not the day before no. the exam filling it up. Yeah. As I've seen so many students, the day before the exam, they get these handwritten one and you can't even know what's written on it. And you say, where's the formula of a circle? And they're like, I don't know, wait. I go, you see, yeah. just waste 10 yeah. minutes yeah. for an exam. Yeah. So I would recommend personally, day one, <laughs> yeah. we could build, we could do two, two kind of memory aid. One, I recommend you carry all the time, like your blanket. And the other one will progressively build it together. Okay, great. Thank no, you. No problem. And, and these are great topics for me because then in the future, if this is an area that we need more help, then I could get other people like orthopedagog and stuff to come and help us more with like different ideas on how to help students with specific learning issues that could be more like related to math or other things because this is uh, this is you know I could uh, we have a service actually of orthopedagogy you know that we could get uh, we could get and have these conversation with them so if you have very specific examples yeah that would be, sorry I'm glad you mentioned that because in word problems. I find I'm breaking down the word problems as we all do for students who the the word, the problem itself is too large, it intimidates them. So, but sometimes I don't know where exactly to break it down for the student. Mathematically, I understand it, but I don't know specifically what makes sense to do it for their, their learning. So just a thought. Oh, that's perfect. But you know, I take notes of all of that and uh, maybe next time I'll try to get somebody who will be able to give us some cues on that. You know, and uh, the other thing is, if you have very specific student works that you want, like specific answer, that would be a great thing. It, like it's, we don't care about this. We care about the student, but we don't care about the student. You know, it's more like 
the the the, the uh, a conversation starter. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, for okay. sure. Okay, thanks. Perfect. And um, any other questions? My hand is up. It's not a question. I just wanted to speak to because you know me. I'm like the rubrics. I pushed the rubrics. But you talked a lot about the student. But one of the things that we, you know, the, the, it's it's the practice for the teacher as well. Because if we're looking at rubrics only once in a while when we're evaluating, our practice or our discernment tends to be um, unfair. Like Ms. Lynn mentioned fairness as well. So getting into that, um, that habit of presenting the rubric, piecemealing it so that we get a you know, accustomed to the language, we can tailor the language, we have the very flexible with each component. That exercise, yes, helps the student, but it also helps us so that when we're faced with this correction, we're able to really have that discernment or are we being fair? Because we can identify if really this meets competency. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Yeah. But you know, we're as strong as our, our, our center huh, of understanding of the rubric, right? As a team, math team, like I said, I've I've heard it so many times. Oh, Miss Amar is so difficult. I want to take uh, Miss Salvaggio well, because she's easier. It's not easy or hard. I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? Jessica has her hand up and I'm talking over it, but that's one, that's in itself, the exercise of understanding the rubric, even for the teachers, to break it down for themselves and then help the students break it down. That exercise, yes, helps the student, but it also helps you in understanding what it is that you need to help the student uh, work towards. And when you're correcting, it saves you time because you're not, you know, just not, not it saves you time, but it also that fairness that Michelin talked about, you will be able to be fair because you will be correcting adequately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Joanna. Jessica. Hi, hi. Uh, no, I just want to thank you. And I actually had a uh, inspiration, as I often do when I listen to this. That's why I come here. Because you remember that, and I feel, you remember that poster I made? That's a Minecraft style poster. Uh, so for anybody who didn't, was, wasn't on the very small chain uh, mail, I made a Minecraft style poster um, that kind of go from the beginning to the end on, in um, solving, you know, task questions in the form of competency. So like 1.2, what you kind of, uh, what you need to show me to get this many coins and 1.1, uh, 1.2, 2.1, 2.2, and it kind of go through the maze of it to reach the end. Uh, Michelin, we should fix it up. Well, you know, yeah, we could fix it up and we could share it because sometimes having it on the wall, and this is another thing. Thank you, Jessica. You brought up a super point. Uh, having it as a, like, how can I say it? Again, handout, we know very well our students loses their stuff all the time. I don't know about you, but I, I had to almost have like a deck of paper every time. Oh, you forgot your homework, there's another one. Oh, you forgot your homework, there's another one. Oh, your computer doesn't work well, there's mine, you know? They always find excuses, and I understand. Listen, this is not to, it's not a judgment, it's not to blame, but we always have to be have plan B, plan C, plan D. But having those great strategies on the walls, so whatever they're, even if they're daydreaming, they're going to read. They have to read. Well, I don't like to say brainwash, but it gets to that, that listen, if you're, if you're surrounded with all these great strategies, <laughs> at the end of the day, something got to stick, you know? So yeah, I, I love to have, the, and, and, and having it in context, like, you know, like you're right, if they, they love uh, this, this kind of games, and we all know how there are a lot of our, our, our students, they're like, they're interested in, in gaming and stuff. So whatever character they're interested in, if they want Mickey Mouse, we'll put Mickey Mouse, I don't care, you know, but uh, yeah, but it's really, really important for, for, to, to, to grab their attention and through their attention, then they'll get to read. So yeah, Jessica, I, I definitely lo would love to rework it and uh, and uh, also, um, you know, have these posters in the classroom. 
please have maybe even a piece of like a, a part of your wall with strategy to use while solving math. Like, you know, what, when, when Shirley, you said, well, they're having a hard time, like in learning situation, what's the process and stuff. But if we have it blown up on the, on the wall somewhere and we'll always refer to it, refer to it, refer to it, eventually they have a visual, you know, that they always look up and they see, you know, it's, it's that repetition. It's that repetition. And again, it's not one way to, to, for everybody, you know, it's not one way fix it all. It's more, it's more like, uh, it's whatever strategy, please share, share your strategy, whatever works for you might work for another student. You know, we're, we're the eternal learners in our classrooms and God knows they come up with these creative solutions, but we know like, oh, I never thought about this like that. <laughs> Let me go back and, you know, challenge you on that and let's have a conversation and hopefully we'll convince them that sometimes it's just, you know, you know, it's, it's another way of doing something or they could convince us of another way of doing something, you know, uh, you know, we're both learners. Um, that brings me uh, to uh, my last point today. And I, again, just to, to make sure um, I've, I've done a lot of collective correction throughout my last four years. And I tell you, every time I do a collective correction with math teachers, there's so much more learning that happens, you know, at La Kievgia, with the Carceral, with everybody, like we've done a lot of small and every practice and every, every conversation you have among other math teacher just brings new outlook on things. And it's very rich. And that was always the comments that I had. So that's why we thought about having the third part as having a collective correction. And I know the uh, the majority of you are far away, uh, which we didn't think, well, we thought of this, but we didn't think of it because again, uh, we, we have to kind of try to accommodate the province. But that being said, if there's another group that are willing to kind of make another session on a Friday afternoon when there's less student, because I know most of you are the only teacher in the building for lots of students and leaving your classroom to come to a collective correction during the week is very difficult. So um, I'm willing to kind of make a couple of sessions if there's a need, but for collective correction, I need the collective collective component, collective components. We had decided that we need at least a minimum of six teachers. So we'll have two groups of three to have actually correct a pretest, a student pretest, and to have these conversations. So part three will only be available by registration. So I would definitely recommend you register, even if the time doesn't fit you, but please write it in the comments. I would love to participate, but I this time scheduled it doesn't work for me. So I will try to kind of rework the schedule that would fit a group of six, a minimum of group of six. All right. So that being said, uh, thanks to Richard, he had put it, uh, he had put the registration form in the chat. Uh, please, any feedback, any comment, any suggestion. For the future, also for a subject that you're interested in, let me know. And we have access to a field of expertise that we could bring in and combine. And also just to let you know, also today, the newsletter that we, we have collectively with RECI and Service Complement, Educative Complementaire got out. There'll be lots of après cours. There's the Formation Nationale Mathematique that's coming up, which is actually a very interesting topic i recommend all of you to show up it's how to trace uh how to to um i think uh, i don't know if i could put uh, hold on if i could put maybe um oh Richard, you want to put maybe the abstract in the thing i recommend you all show up and reserve those dates because it's um it's about teaching mathematics um, teaching mathematics but uh keeping um through triangulation, evaluation through tri triangulation. So how do we evaluate our student through uh, uh, triangulation? It's called triangulation. I don't know the right term in English, but where you have an oral component, kinesthetic component, and a production component. It's, it's the same and, term, Micheline. It's the same oh, term. Using triangulation? triangulation for affirmative assessment. Yeah, for evaluation. Yeah. 
it. So just to let you know that that's also coming up, you know, so uh, it's how to keep up with the students to be able to make sure the students master a, a competency or a criteria, you know, a, a specific, uh, a specific uh, competency that you wanna, you want them to to know. So that being said, and sorry, I, when is that? That's if I'm not mistaken, the twenty third, right, Richard? Twenty third of November, from one to four. And uh, sorry, and where, uh, where is it? That, uh, we okay. Uh, you're gonna receive the uh, newsletter. Have you? Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a, there's a link there, a Zoom link, you know. Or I think Richard, if they come to the après cours, they could. If you come to the après cours on the day and the time, this is uh, you could come in and uh, yeah, because those uh, on the French side they usually have five because they have a lot more. Uh, you know how can I say a lot more staff? <laughs> I'm the only one, so I kept the thing going. But we're we're I just I do two a year, huge ones like that with research and you know uh, other you know interesting interesting topics more uh what's what's happening recently on the market to bring to you so we thought uh, the triangular uh, you know every uh, like i mean uh, evaluation through triangulation is a very very interesting concept and this is where we're moving towards eventually uh you know with lots of changes and there will be a second one a second one in january uh, in uh, january if i'm not mistaken towards the end or early february which talks about the mathematic intervention framework. We're talking about observation uh, grids and how to evaluate your students and how to gather through evaluation grid on watching them orally, again, through the triangulation thing. So there's a nice continuation with it that's uh, coming up. So these are what's, hap what's, what's new and current on the market, in the math market, teaching math market. <laughs> what else to say you know to make it uh, in our fields so these are big big topics big uh, waves that are coming in and of course of course ai <laughs> but that's going to be a whole conversation for another time yeah and i think giovanna and i will probably look into it because that's going to be with digital competent like you know the digital pedagog pedagog numeric and uh, curriculum that's going to be tackling that these are all major major things that are hitting the grounds <laughs> so that being said please again this this time and this space is mainly for math teachers i will be inviting the uh uh the program uh responsible responsible the program eventually to come and and meet the team and also uh potentially i would, could also invite martin francar also who's like uh, the head of evaluations well i guess uh, responsible de evaluation i don't know what's his title in that specific uh, you know so if we have specific questions on like evaluation differently looking at things differently he'll be the right person to do that I also have access, like I said to you, to service complementaire. I have Karine Jacques, I have Lucie Tremblay, I have, Mar you know, I have great people that could come and complement whatever needs you have in your milieu. So thank you, Shirley, for bringing this up. I will definitely bring it up on how to break down literacy questions so that I, I, I will consult and come back to you on that. Because there's so many ways of doing it, but at least we'll we'll have someone who will be able to give us perspective and when to use what, because there's a lot of theories on that. Thank you so much for coming. It was really rich for me, as much as I hope something you learned, something I shared with you. Uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks again.